This chapter of our textbook talks about relational databases. So we're going to start diving into databases in this part of the course, talking about the language that we use to modify and get data inside of them called SQL or SQL. The chapter though is going to give us kind of a higher perspective. What is a database and how does it help out in a modern organization? So a couple different things we're going to look at for our learning objectives. Uh, first off, you know, what are databases giving us? You know, what are the major advantages? Um, why are they different from it's just a standard file-based system? We're going to talk about some basic systems, and we have this acronym called DBMS, Database Management System. We'll discuss how to well structure relational data. And this is, gets at the idea that when you put data into a database, we have to put it into a certain format. That's really important in preventing problems in the future. All right, so think about, you know, why do we have a database? Well, you can kind of imagine an uncontrolled library. So imagine you have just a stack of books in the hallway in the building. Anyone who wants to can grab something or put it back. Well, it pretty quickly gets to be kind of chaotic and random. And that's what happens in a company if you just sort of throw everything onto a shared Google file folder or a Dropbox. So we think, well, there's a bunch of downsides here. Um, we when we look at it, uh, imagine that we go from this uncontrolled library to a controlled library. So now we have a person standing there. Well, what advantages does that person give us? Well, the first one we have is security. So with the person standing there, you don't get access to the library or the books unless you have a library card. We also get the advantage of consistency and control. So as this librarian controls access to our library, they're going to make sure that books are filed in the right way. Uh, whether we do a Dewey Decimal Scheme or alphabetically by author, whatever it is, they're going to ensure everyone puts books back properly and they can get books out correctly. We also see advantages of the sort of librarian role as they can interface with different kinds of clients. And so for our example of a library in the hallway, you might think about a marketing student versus accounting student versus managing student. They're going to be able to know what each person needs, or what their discipline requirements are, and be able to talk to them in a way that makes sense. Now, of course, there are some disadvantages. Uh, first one is cost. We have to pay the person. And so a database management system, DBMS, is going to be expensive. This coordination also results in a lack of adaptability. So think about our hallway example. If you want, you can make a new stack whenever we feel like it. We can move things around. We can let things emerge over time. But once we have this control, this uh, librarian role, they're going to have to kind of work to make sure everybody's happy before making changes. We also need a little bit of technical knowledge to handle the catalog. And so this is kind of the idea of, like, if you go to the WVU library, you'll notice that you have to figure out, like, where is the book physically located in the library? Uh, what's the Dewey Decimal System? There's just a lot more work to kind of get things aligned technically. So what is a database then? A database is a way to efficiently control information. So basically, the database is the term for a group of tables combined together. Tables have rows and rows have fields. So as one example, you could have a database for our payroll information. Inside the payroll database, you have a checks table and employees table, and then you have fields for each one of these. You can kind of think of it like an Excel file as being a database. And then inside of that one file, you have multiple sheets. And then inside of each sheet, you have rows. All right, so the overall file will be the database. Each sheet would be a table. And then each of the rows would have fields. We can kind of view it this way as well, if you want to kind of view it vertically and in sort of a flowcharty way. We have the database, we have tables, we each record, and then each record's got fields. Now, one of the big things we use databases for is to coordinate between different pieces of software. And so often what you'll have is a single database for your ERP system in an organization, and then different programs will all tie into this one single database. So you might have sales, you might have shipping, you might have billing, all tying into one location. And this is actually really important because you want to have a single source of truth for any fact that you have inside of your system. And a fact could be a person's name, it could be their person's address. I mean, think about a comparison for WVU. When you come to WVU, we want to record your name in one single place and then access that in multiple systems. We want to access that in your 
your system for managing book check-ins and checkouts. We want to manage that for your transcript, for the registrar, for alumni, anything. We want to have a single place to find that fact. All right, so let's talk about some advantages. All right, key advantages. We integrate data together and then share it. So we store your name in one single place at a time and then use it in different programs. The big goal here is to reduce data redundancy and consistency. Imagine if you need to update your name. For example, someone gets married. Uh, if every single part of WVU stores your name in a different system, you're going to have to go and get it updated like five, six, seven, eight, nine times. But if we store it all in one place, we can update it one time and then be good to go. We also want to keep data independent of the programs that use it. And the idea here is primarily reporting and cross-functional analysis. So the idea is that we want to have a single source of truth across the organization, which means we need to coordinate between all the different pieces and parts to answer big questions. Now, all these advantages also lead to disadvantages. So because data is integrated, that means it requires coordination now between different parts of an organization. So as an example for WVU, you might say that the fact that it's stored in one place means that alumni, registrar, and everybody needs to agree on what form your name takes. Well, imagine that you go by a nickname. You might want the nickname used for your classes, but your full name used for your transcript. And now that's tricky because then we say, okay, well, how do we store your name? Are you Robert or are you Bob or are you capital B, whatever it is. So this slows changes in the data set as well. It makes it harder to change anything because we've got multiple programs all feeding in here. We also have a complex data structure. Because we're coordinating between different parts of the organization and we want to keep the data as flexible as possible, we're going to need to break it into multiple tables. So you might have a table for just your name. You might have a table for addresses. You might have a table for phone numbers. And then when we do a report, we've got to pull all the different tables together to give us our information. And because of this coordination, data is not really that independent of the programs that use it. Practically what happens is every program has a specific format that they want. Sometimes what we can do is we can sort of automatically copy data back and forth between programs, sort of synchronize it up, but it does still require that upfront work. And one of the key skills we have here is SQL, SQL. This is coding we write to pull data out and properly organize it. So let's get into organization. So we think about a standard computer, we have file folders on your computer. Uh, your file folders is a hierarchical system, meaning that everything lives inside of a larger folder. We often find things with search. We use sort of raw text of, and names to find things. Uh, so it's fairly straightforward. You might also think about spreadsheet as a way of organizing data. Now, all of these have problems, though. For a file system, because files can only exist in a single folder, if it really connects to two different areas, you have to decide which one to put it in. For just a spreadsheet, one of the major problems we have is that as you use it over time, people add things onto it. You may be adding a column or row, putting a chart on the right-hand side. And once people do that, the data gets kind of chaotic and less organized. So we're going to look at relational data. Now, relation is kind of a weird word. It's not talking about dating or anything like that. It's saying that there's this sort of formal structure that we use and a set of rules to define how that data connects to itself. And so what this will give us is it gives us the data that feels like one entity, and it's going to break it up into multiple tables. And we can combine this in multiple ways. So we can look at an example here. We have some sales data stored for this table, and we're looking at it, and we're saying, okay, what are some problems that we have here? Well, there's three primary problems. If you look at it, we have an update, insert, and delete problem. For an update problem, you'll notice that we have information for Vivian stored in multiple places. So Vivian exists for both sales, uh, the first line of the sales and the second line of the sales as well. If we have to go in and change Vivian's name, you might miss updating it for every single row. We also have insert anomaly. If I try to insert more data here, I can't put information on a customer in unless I also have information on their sales as well. And then I have a delete problem. If I get rid of one of these rows, one of the sales, then I also lose information on Vivian's name and address. So as a kind of a better way of viewing it, we can see here that Lola Doyle would need to have a new address for every customer row updated. Removing the sale room deletes the customer, and you cannot insert a customer without a sale. 
So we want to split this up into multiple tables. Here are the actual entities that we have for this one table. We have our sale invoice, in other words, a line on the invoice. We have our customer. We have the customer's address. We have an item. And we also have a sale price quantity. So how do we connect these together? Well, we're going to use this idea of a key. Now, the key is sort of a tricky term. But you need to think of it as both things. It's going to be a primary and a foreign key. The question is, which table is it in? If a key is in the entity it describes field, then we call it primary, and it shows up one time. We're also going to use that same key in other tables to link to the primary key, and it's going to be used multiple times. Then it's going to be a foreign key. If you think of an example, you might think about a student ID number. When that student ID number is in the student table, it's going to appear one time because it's one person. But we're also going to have another table of, say, grades or class enrollments. At that point, the information is going to show up multiple times. So that'd be a foreign key. So let's look at our example that we have here. Which are the primary and which are the foreign keys? Well, the primary keys are in green here. So we have our customer Vivian with customer ID 151. We have our sales invoice ID with our sales item. And we also have items. These are all primary keys. Then what we'll do is we're going to add that same information into another table and use it to link. So for my sales invoice, I have a primary key of the invoice ID and a foreign key of the customer ID. And what's going to happen is that is going to show us who the customer is that owns that sales invoice. Same thing for an address. If I do an address for Vivian Rogers, I want to tie it to her customer ID. So the primary key is 151 in this table over here, and a foreign key on the right-hand side over here. We have more foreign keys down on the bottom over here. You notice we you don't even have a primary key. Each row here relates to both a sales invoice and it re relates to an item as well. Now, this is the way we're going to break up our table information. Now, other problems we might have here is what's called repeating groups. So often when you start with a spreadsheet, you start with some of a simple data structure. For example, one row per sale. But then you have someone who wants to do two items for a sale instead of one. And what people often do is they make repeating groups. So we can see we have our item one, and then we have our item two. The problem with this is if I try to sum all of the sales, I've got to add up all of the items from quantity one and all the items from quantity two. If I want to find out how many items I've sold, I have to find out how many quantity ones are there and all the non-null items in quantity two. So it makes it much more complicated. Instead, of what I really need to do is I want to have a sales table that stores one row per item. So here are some key rules that we're going to look at. Every column in a row must have a single value. So we can't repeat values. Our primary key cannot be empty or null. If a foreign key is present, it's got to link to something that has a primary key. So as an example here, I can't have a sales that doesn't relate to a customer. And everything in a table should depend on the primary key. So if we follow these rules, it's going to let our databases be normalized and solve a lot of these problems. Now, you're not going to design tables, but if you understand these rules, it helps you understand how a table is actually being set up. So let's look at some violations here. What are columns in a row that are not single valued? And you can kind of look at the example down here, and you can see some obvious ones like shipping address. Shipping address has got the, the street, the city, the name. You know, that's not one single value. It needs to be one particular item. We can't have null sales ID. If there's a foreign key, it's got to match to something. So this 9999 can't be valid because it doesn't match to an actual customer. And then everything should depend on the primary key. So our primary key is sales ID. Well, our customer name depends on the customer ID. If I change the ID, the name changes. And so this really should be in its own table. So this is the idea of normalization. Now, the book also gets into semantic data modeling, which we're not going to handle in this course. Queries. So now that we understand how it's designed, we're going to use a query to connect these tables and give us the answer that we're looking for. You might have used Microsoft Access before. Access is a visual way of creating SQL code. So we have our two tables up at the top. We have a connection where we have our customer ID primary key 
connects to the foreign ID in the sales table here. And then we can see we have some fields that are selected in the middle. We have a where condition on the side. And then um, our checkbox is to show what field I want to see in the result. All of that translates down to the bottom here where I have my SQL view. My SQL view says what fields do I want to see? What table? How should I join with other tables on certain conditions? And then where certain values are true. So Lola Doyle down here on the bottom is the same as Lola de la Loya sorry, Lola Doyle here in the criteria. The join I see on the second line is the same as the join on the top here. So it's just a visual way of looking at it. Now, why do we want queries? We want queries because different people need different views of the data. For example, one person might need a view of what accounts are past due. And so we build a query for them that it lists each person by name. But another person may not need that level of access. They instead need to know what are just the general sales by region. And so they get one that's summarized down by region as well. So the DBMS has queries in it that then allow different people to get different levels of access to information. And here's another way of viewing kind of the same idea here. We've got three different sort of logical views or schemas of the data. Those are mapped to different tables, and then those actually connect to different data inside of our SQL database system. So this is then just kind of written out the same thing. We have logical views. Uh, there's also physical views of how the data is actually stored. And then, of course, designers need to understand users' needs to sort of structure the database efficiently. Now we can think of this logical view versus physical view in different ways. Let's think about how we want to actually store something like uh, some Christmas tree lights. All right, Data that you need re regularly, uh, you want to store in a really easily accessible location. Data that's not as common, you want to put in slower, cheaper storage. So for our Christmas tree lights, if I only need them once a year, I don't want to store them in a cupboard that's in my entryway because that's very high value storage. It's expensive. I might put it in my basement, or I might even stick it into an external storage unit. So the external storage unit is cheaper, but slower to access. But because I don't need it very often, that's a great place to put it. So when you design a database, we have this conceptual view. And usually this comes out in something called a data dictionary. A data dictionary is kind of a blueprint of our database, where we describe what data we want to store. So here's an example of a data dictionary. This is listing each field in my database, talks about where it comes from, how long it is, where it's used, any sort of access restrictions on it. So access restrictions are an important idea as well. In most databases, we want to think about who needs access. We define this with four basic levels called CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. We think back to our you know, example of you know, Christmas tree lights. Uh, maybe we're storing information about our lights or maybe our light inventory. Well, if one person might need rights to be able to create new records, but most people are probably only going to have the read rights where they can see how many inventory units we have available. A few people will be given update where they can change it. And then very few people, maybe none, will be given delete rights. And that's because usually we don't want to delete data out of our system. Instead, most databases will actually have this flag or a field called is deleted. That's just another column with a true or a false value. And then we'll just use that to hide rows if they're deleted. And that allows us to audit more efficiently. So the good thing is that we have these active databases with really good up-to-date information. And one of the common things accountants will need to do is to create reports off of it. And so your boss might come to you and say, hey, I've got this report that is giving me my inventory, but I really need it broken down by department, or I need it sorted a certain way, or grouped a certain way. And if you understand how databases work and how SQL works, then you can get in and give them that view of the data. So finally, here are a couple of queries you probably want to, or sorry, a couple of key terms you'll probably want to know. But overall, that should get you to the major elements of this chapter. In class, we're going to play with actual writing of SQL. And I think that's where this really comes together as you actually create the queries and see how they all tie together.